Chapter Two of Genji Monogatari. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Genji Monogatari by Murasaki Shikabu. Translated by Suyamats Genchio. Chapter Two The Broom Like Tree. Hikal Genji, the name is singularly well known and is the subject of innumerable remarks and censures. Indeed, he had many intrigues in his lifetime, and most of them are vividly preserved in our memories. He had always striven to keep all these intrigues in the utmost secrecy and had to appear constantly virtuous. This caution was observed to such an extent. That he scarcely accomplished anything really romantic, a fact which Katano no Shiosho would have ridiculed. Even with such jealous watchfulness, secrets easily transpire from one to another, so loquacious is man. Moreover, he had, unfortunately from nature, a disposition of not appreciating anything within easy reach, but of directing his thought in undesirable quarters. Hence sundry improprieties in his career. Now it was the season of continuous rain, namely the month of May, and the court was keeping a strict monoemi. Genji, who had now been made a chichio, and who was still continuing his residence in the imperial palace, was also confined to his apartments for a considerable length of time. His father in law naturally felt for him, and his sons were sent to bear him company. Among these, Kuran Shiosho, who was now elevated to the post of Tono Chiuchio, proved to be the most intimate and interesting companion. He was married to the fourth daughter of the Udaijin, but being a man of lively disposition, he too, like Genji, did not often resort to the mansion of the bride. When Genji went to the Sadaijins, he was always his favourite associate. They were together in their studies and in their sports, and accompanied each other everywhere, and so all stiffness and formality were dispensed with, and they did not scruple to reveal their secrets to each other. It was on an evening in the above mentioned season. Rain was falling drearily. The inhabitants of the palace had almost all retired. And the apartment of Genji was more than usually still. He was engaged in reading near a lamp, but at length mechanically put his book aside and began to take out some letters and writings from a bureau which stood on one side of the room. Tono Chiochio happened to be present, and Genji soon gathered from his countenance that he was anxious to look over them. Yes, said Genji, some you may see, but there may be others. Those others, retorted Tō no Chiochio, are precisely those which I wish to see. Ordinary ones, even your humble servant may have received. I only long to look upon those which may have been written by fair hands, when the tender writer had something to complain of, or when in twilight hour she was outpouring all her yearning. Being so pressed, Genji allowed his brother in law to see them all. It is, however, highly probable that any very sacred letters would not have been loosely deposited in an ordinary bureau, and these would therefore seem, after all, to have been of second rate importance. What a variety! said Tono Chiochio as he turned them over, and he asked several questions guessingly about this or that. About some he guessed correctly, about others he was puzzled and suspicious. Genji smiled and spoke little, only making some obscure remark and continuing as he took the letters. But you surely must have collected many. Will you not show me some? And then my bureau also may open more easily. You do not suppose I have any worth reading, do you? replied Tono Chiochio. I have only just now discovered, continued he, how difficult it is to meet with a fair creature of whom one can say, This is indeed the one. Here is at last perfection. There are indeed many who fascinate, 
many who are ready with their pens, and who, when occasion may require, are quick at repartee. But how often such girls as these are conceited about their own accomplishments, and endeavour unduly to disparage those of others. There are, again, some who are special pets of their parents, and most jealously watched over at home. Often, no doubt, they are pretty, often graceful, and frequently they will apply themselves with effect to music and to poetry, in which they may even attain to special excellence. But then their friends will keep their drawbacks in the dark, and eulogise their merits to the utmost. If we were to give full credence to this exaggerated praise, we could not but fail in every single instance to be more or less disappointed. So saying, Tono Chiochio paused, and appeared as if he were ashamed of having such an experience, when Genji smilingly remarked, Can any one of them, however, exist without at least one good point? Nay, were there any so little favoured as that, no one would ever be misled at all, replied Tono Chiochio. And he continued, In my opinion, the most and the least favoured are in the same proportion. I mean, they are both not many. Their birth also divides them into three classes. Those, however, who are especially well born are often too jealously guarded, and are for the most part kept secluded from the outside gaze, which frequently tends to make their deportment shy and timid. It is those of the middle class who are much more frequently seen by us, who afford us most chance of studying their character. As for the lower class, it would be almost useless to trouble ourselves with them. Thus Tono Chiochio appeared to be thoroughly at home in his description of the merits of the fair sex, which made Genji amused, and he said, But how do you define the classes you have referred to, and classify them into three? Those who are of high birth sink sometimes in the social scale, until the distinction of their rank is forgotten in the abjectness of their present position. Others again of low origin rise to a high position, and with self-important faces and in ostentatious residences regard themselves as inferior to none. Into what class will you allot these? Just at this moment Sama no Kami and To Shikup no Jio joined the party, they came to pay their respects to Genji, and both of them were gay and light-hearted talkers. So Tono Chiochio now made over the discussion to them, and it was carried to rather questionable lengths. However exalted a lady's position may be, said Sama no Kami, if her origin is an unenviable one, the estimation of the public for her will be widely different from that which it shows to those who are naturally entitled to it. If again adverse fortune assails one whose birth is high, so that she becomes friendless and helpless, degradation here will meet our eyes, though her heart may still remain as noble as ever. Examples of both of these are very common. After much reflection, I can only come to the conclusion that both of them should be included in the middle class. In this class, too, must be included many daughters of the Durio, who occupy themselves with local administration. These ladies are often very attractive and are not seldom introduced at court and enjoy high favour. And successes depend pretty much upon the state of one's fortune, I fancy, interrupted Genji with a placid smile. That is a remark very unlikely to fall from the lips of a champion of romance, chimed in Tono Chiosho. There may be some, resumed Sama no Kami, who are of high birth and to whom public respect is duly paid, yet whose domestic education has been much neglected. Of a lady such as this we may simply remark, why and how is it that she is so brought up, and she would only cause discredit to her class. There are, of course, some who combine in themselves every perfection befitting their position. These best of the best are, however, not within everyone's reach. But listen, within an old dilapidated gateway, almost unknown to the world, and overgrown with wild vegetation, 
Perchance we might find, shut up, a maiden charming beyond imagination. Her father might be an aged man, corpulent in person and stern in mien, and her brothers of repulsive countenance. But there, in an uninviting room, she lives, full of delicacy and sentiment, and fairly skilled in the arts of poetry or music, which she may have acquired by her own exertions alone, unaided. If there were such a case, surely she deserves our attention, save that of those of us who themselves are highly exalted in position. So saying, Sama no Kami winked slyly at Shikab no Jyo. The latter was silent. Perhaps he fancied that Sama no Kami was speaking in the above strain with a hidden reference to his Shikub's sisters, who, he imagined, answered the description. Meantime, Genji may have thought, if it is so difficult to choose one even from the best class, how can... Uh... And he began to close his eyes and doze. His dress was of soft white silk, partly covered by the naoshi, worn carelessly with its cord left loose and untied. His appearance and bearing formed quite a picture. Meanwhile, the conversation went on about different persons and characters, and Sama no Kami proceeded. It is unquestionable that though at first glance many women appear to be without defects, yet when we come to the actual selection of any one of them, we should seriously hesitate in our choice. Let me illustrate my meaning by reference to the numerous public men who may be aspiring to fulfil the duties of several important posts. You will at once recognise the great difficulty there would be in fixing upon the individual statesman under whose guardianship the empire could best repose. And supposing that if at last by good fortune the most able man were designated, even then we must bear in mind that it is not in the power of one or two individuals, however gifted they may be, to carry on the whole administration of the kingdom alone. Public business can only be tranquilly conducted when the superior receives the assistance of subordinates, and when the subordinate yields a becoming respect and loyalty to his superior. And affairs are thus conducted in a spirit of mutual conciliation. So too it is in the narrow range of the domestic circle. To make a good mistress of that circle one must possess, if our ideal is to be fully realised, many important qualifications. Were we to be constantly indulging in the severity of criticism, always objecting to this or that, a perfect character would be almost unattainable. Men should therefore bear with patience any trifling dissatisfaction which they may feel, and strive constantly to keep alive, to augment, and to cherish the warmth of their early love. Only such a man as this can be called faithful, and the partner of such a man alone can enjoy the real happiness of affection. How unsatisfactory to us, however, seems the actual world if we look round upon it. Still more difficult must it be to satisfy such as you who seek your companions but from among the best. How varied are the characters and the dispositions of women. Some who are youthful and favoured by nature strive almost selfishly to keep themselves with the utmost reserve. If they write, they write harmlessly and innocently, yet at the same time they are choice in their expressions which have delicate touches of bewitching sentiment. This might possibly make us entertain a suddenly conceived fancy for them, yet they would give us but slight encouragement. They may allow us just to hear their voices, but when we approach them, they will speak with subdued breath and almost inaudibly. Beware, however, lest among these you chance to encounter some astute artiste, who, under a surface that is smooth, conceals a current that is deep. This sort of lady, it is true, generally appears quite modest, but often proves, when we come closer, to be of a very different temperament from what we anticipated. Here is one drawback to be guarded against. 
Among characters differing from the above, some are too full of sentimental sweetness. Whenever occasion offers them romance, they become spoilt. Such would be decidedly better if they had less sentiment and more sense. Others, again, are singularly earnest, too earnest, indeed, in the performance of their domestic duty, and such, with their hair pushed back, devote themselves like household drudges to household affairs. Man, whose duties generally call him from home all day, naturally hears and sees the social movements both of public and private life, and notices different things, both good and bad. Of such things he would not like to talk freely with strangers, but only with someone closely allied to him. Indeed, a man may have many things in his mind which cause him to smile or to grieve. Occasionally something of a political nature may irritate him beyond endurance. These matters he would like to talk over with his fair companion, that she might soothe him and sympathise with him. But a woman, as above described, is often unable to understand him, or does not endeavour to do so, and this only makes him more miserable. At another time he may brood over his hopes and aspirations, but he has no hope of solace. She is not only incapable of sharing these with him, but might carelessly remark, "'What ails you?' How severely would this try the temper of a man? If, then, clearly we see all these, the only suggestion I can make is that the best thing to do is to choose one who is gentle and modest, and strive to guide and educate her according to the best ideal we may think of. This is the best plan, and why should we not do so? Our efforts would not be surely all in vain. But no, a girl whom we thus educate and who proves to be competent to bear us company often disappoints us when she is left alone. She may then show her incapability, and her occasional actions may be done in such an unbecoming manner that both good and bad are equally displeasing. Are not all these against us men? Remember, however, that there are some who may not be very agreeable at ordinary times, yet who flash occasionally upon us with a potent and almost irresistible charm. The Sama no Kami, though eloquent, not having come to one point or another, remained thoughtful for some minutes, and again resumed. After all, as I have once observed, I can only make this suggestion, that we should not too much consider either birth or beauty, but select one who is gentle and tranquil, and consider her to be best suited for our last haven of rest. If, in addition, she is of fair position and is blessed with sweetness of temper, we should be delighted with her and not trouble ourselves to search or notice any trifling deficiency, and the more so as, if her conscience is clear and pure, calmness and serenity of features can naturally be looked for. There are women who are too diffident and too reserved, and carry their generosity to such an extent as to pretend not to be aware even of such annoyances as afford them just grounds of complaint. A time arrives when their sorrows and anxieties become greater than they can bear. Even then, however, they cannot resort to plain speaking and complain, but instead thereof they will fly away to some remote retreat among the mountain hamlets or to some secluded spot by the seaside, leaving behind them some painful letter or despairing verses, and making themselves mere sad memories of the past. Often when a boy I heard such stories read by ladies, and the sad pathos of them even caused my tears to flow. But now I can only declare such deeds to be acts of mere folly. For what does it all amount to? Simply to this that the woman, in spite of the pain which it causes her, and discarding a heart which may be still lingering towards her, takes to flight, regardless of the feelings of others, of the anguish and of the anxiety which those who are dearest to her suffer with her. Nay, this act of folly may even be committed simply to test the sincerity of her lover's affection for her. What pitiable subtlety! Worse than this, 
the woman thus led astray, perhaps by ill advice, may even be beguiled into more serious errors. In the depth of her despairing melancholy, she will become a nun. Her conscience, when she takes the fatal vow, may be pure and unsullied, and nothing may seem able to call her back again to the world which she forsook. But, as time rolls on, some household servant or aged nurse brings her tidings of the lover who has been unable to cast her out of his heart, and whose tears drop silently when he hears aught about her. Then, when she hears of his affections still living, and his heart still yearning, and thinks of the uselessness of the sacrifice she has made voluntarily, she touches the hair on her forehead, and she becomes regretful. She may, indeed, do her best to persevere in her resolve, but if one single tear bedews her cheek, she is no longer strong in the sanctity of her vow. Weakness of this kind would be in the eyes of Buddha more sinful than those offences which are committed by those who never leave the lay circle at all, and she would eventually wander about in the wrong passage. But there are also women who are too self-confident and obtrusive. These, if they discover some slight inconsistency in men, fiercely betray their indignation and behave with arrogance. A man may show a little inconsistency occasionally, but yet his affection may remain. Then matters will in time become right again, and they will pass their lives happily together. If, therefore, the woman cannot show a tolerable amount of patience, this will but add to her unhappiness. She should, above all things, strive not to give way to excitement, and when she experiences any unpleasantness, she should speak of it frankly but with moderation. And if there should be anything worse than unpleasantness, she should even then complain of it in such a way as not to irritate the man. If she guides her conduct on principles such as these, even her very words, her very demeanour, may in all probability increase his sympathy and consideration for her. One self-denial and the restraint which one imposes upon oneself often depend on the way in which another behaves to us. The woman who is too indifferent and too forgiving is also inconsiderate. Remember, the unmoored boat floats about. Is it not so? Tono Chiochio quickly nodded assent, as he said, Quite true. A woman who has no strength of emotion, no passion of sorrow or of joy, can never be holders of us. Nay, even jealousy, if not carried to the extent of undue suspicion, is not undesirable. If we ourselves are not in fault and leave the matter alone, such jealousy may easily be kept within due bounds. But stop, added he suddenly. Some women have to bear and do bear every grief that they may encounter with unmurmuring and suffering patience. So said Tono Chiuchio, who implied by this allusion that his sister was a woman so circumstanced. But Genji was still dozing, and no remark came from his lips. Sama no Kami had been recently made a doctor of literature, and, like a bird, was inflating his feathers, so Tono Chiuchio, willing to draw him out as much as possible, gave him every encouragement to proceed with his discourse. Again, therefore, he took up the conversation and said, Call to your mind affairs in general and judge of them. Is it not always true that reality and sincerity are to be preferred to mere artificial excellence? Artisans, for instance, make different sorts of articles as their talents serve them. Some of them are keen and expert and cleverly manufacture objects of temporary fashion which have no fixed or traditional style, and which are only intended to strike the momentary fancy. These, however, are not the true artisans. The real excellence of the true artisan is tested by those who make without defects or sensational peculiarities, articles to decorate, we will say, some particular building, in conformity with correct taste, and high aesthetic principles. 
Look for another instance at the eminence which has been attained by several of the artists of the Imperial College of Painting. Take the case of draughtsmen in black ink. Pictures indeed, such as those of Mount Horé, which has never been beheld by mortal eye, or of some raging monstrous fish in a rough sea, or of a wild animal of some far-off country, or of the imaginary face of the demon, are often drawn with such striking vividness that people are startled at the sight of them. These pictures, however, are neither real nor true. On the other hand, ordinary scenery of familiar mountains, of calm streams of water, and of dwellings just before our eyes, may be sketched with an irregularity so charming, and with such excellent skill, as almost to rival nature. In pictures such as these, the perspective of gentle mountain slopes, and sequestered nooks surrounded by leafy trees, are drawn with such admirable fidelity to nature, that they carry the spectator in imagination to something beyond them. These are the pictures in which is mostly evinced the spirit and effectiveness of the superior hand of a master, and in these an inferior artist would only show dullness and inefficiency. Similar observations are applicable to handwriting. Some people boldly dash away with great freedom and endless flourishes, and appear at the first glance to be elegant and skilful. But that which is written with scrupulous neatness, in accordance with the true rules of penmanship, constitutes a very different handwriting from the above. If perchance the upstrokes and downstrokes do not at first sight appear to be fully formed, yet when we take it up and critically compare it with writing in which dashes and flourishes predominate, we shall at once see how much more of real and sterling merit it possesses. Such, then, is the nature of the case in painting, in penmanship, and in the arts generally. And how much more, then, are those women undeserving of our admiration, who, though they are rich in outward and in fashionable display, attempting to dazzle our eyes, are yet lacking in the solid foundations of reality, fidelity, and truth. Do not, my friends, consider me going too far, but let me proceed to illustrate these observations by my own experience. So saying, Sama no Kami advanced his seat, and Genji awoke. Tono Chiuchio was quite interested in the conversation and was keeping his eye upon the speaker, leaning his cheek upon his hand. This long discourse of Samanukami no reminds us of the preacher's sermon and amuses us, and it seems that on occasions like these one may easily be carried away by circumstances until he is willing to communicate even his own private affairs. It was at a time, continued Samanukami, no when I was in a still more humble position that there was a girl to whom I had taken a fancy. She was like one of those whom I described in the process of my discourse, not a regular beauty, although for this reason my youthful vanity did not allow me to pledge myself to her for ever, I still considered her a pleasant companion. Nevertheless, from occasional fits of restlessness, I roamed often here and there. This she always resented fiercely and with so much indignation that I sighed for a sweeter temper and more moderation. Indeed, there were times when her suspicion and spitefulness were more than I could endure. But my irritation was generally calmed down, and I even felt sorry myself when I reflected how strong and devoted her affection for me was, in spite of the mean state of my circumstances. As to her general character, her only endeavour seemed to be to do everything for my sake, even what was beyond her powers, while she struggled to perfect herself in anything in which she might be deficient, and took the most faithful care of all my interests, striving constantly and earnestly to please me. She appeared at first even too zealous, but in time became more moderate. She seemed as if she felt uneasy lest her plain face should cause me displeasure, and she even denied herself the sight of other people, in order to avoid unbecoming comment. 
As time went by, the more I became accustomed to observe how really simple-hearted she was, the more I sympathised with her. The one thing that I could not bear, however, was that jealousy of hers. Sincere and devoted as she is, thought I, is there no means of ridding her of this jealous weakness? Could I but do that, it would not matter even if I were to alarm her a little. And I also thought that since she was devoted to me, if I showed any symptoms of getting tired of her, she would in all probability be warned by it. Therefore I purposely behaved to her with great coolness and heartlessness. This she resented as usual. I then said to her that though our affection had been of old date, I should not see her again. If you wish to sever from me, you may suspect me as much as you like. If you prefer to enjoy long happiness with me in future, be modest and patient in trifling matters. If you can only be so, how can I do otherwise than love you? My position also may in time be improved, and then we may enjoy greater happiness. In saying this, I thought I had managed matters very ingeniously. Without meaning it, however, I had in fact spoken a little too harshly. She replied with a bitter smile that to put up with a life of undistinguished condition, even though with faint hopes of future promotion, was not a thing about which we ought to trouble ourselves, but that it was indeed a hard task to pass long wearisome days in waiting until a man's mind should be restored to a sense of propriety and that for this reason we had perhaps better separate at once. This she said with such sarcastic bitterness that I was irritated and stung to the quick, and overwhelmed her with a fresh torrent of reproaches. At this junction she gave way to an uncontrollable fit of passion, and snatching up my hand she thrust my little finger into her mouth and bit off the end of it. Then, notwithstanding my pain, I became quite cool and collected, and calmly said, Insulted and maimed as I have now been, it is most fitting that I should absent myself for the future from polite society. Office and title would ill become me now. Your spite has now left me without spirit to face the world in which I should be ridiculed, and has left me no alternative but to withdraw my maimed person from the public gaze. After I had alarmed her by speaking in this exalted strain, I added, "'Today we meet for the last time.' And bending these fingers, pointing to them as she spoke, I made the farewell remark. "'When on my fingers I may say, I count the hours I spent with thee, is this and this alone, I pray, the only pang you've caused to me. You are now quits with me.' At the instance I said so, she burst into tears, and without premeditation, poured forth the following. From me who long bore grievous harms from that cold hand and wandering heart, you now withdraw your sheltering arms, and coolly tell me we must part. To speak the truth, I had no real intention of separating from her altogether. For some time, however, I sent her no communication, and was passing rather an unsettled life. Well, I was once returning from the palace late one evening in November, after an experimental practice of music for a special festival in the Temple of Kamo. Sleet was falling heavily. The wind blew cold, and my road was dark and muddy. There was no house near where I could make myself at home. To return and spend a lonely night in the palace was not to be thought of. At this moment a reflection flashed across my mind. How cold must she feel whom I have treated so coldly, thought I, and suddenly became very anxious to know what she felt and what she was about. This made me turn my steps towards her dwelling, and brushing away the snow that had gathered on my shoulders I trudged on. At one moment shyly biting my nails, at another thinking that on such a night at least all her enmity towards me might be all melted away, I approached the house. The curtains were not drawn, and I saw the dim light of a lamp reflected on the windows. It was even perceivable that a soft quilt was being warmed and thrown over the large couch. 
The scene was such as to give you the notion that she was really anticipating that I might come at least on such an evening. This gave me encouragement. But alas, she whom I hoped to see was not at home. I was told she had gone to her parents that very evening. Previous to that time she had sent me no sad verses, no conciliatory letter, and this had already given birth to unpleasant feelings on my part. And at this moment when I was told that she had gone away, all these things seemed to have been done almost purposely. And I involuntarily began to suspect that her very jealousy had only been assumed by her on purpose to cause me to become tired of her. As I reflected what our future might be after such an estrangement as this, I was truly depressed. I did not, however, give up all hope, thinking that she would not be so determined as to abandon me for ever. I had even carefully selected some stuff for a dress for her. Some time, however, passed away without anything particularly occurring. She neither accepted nor refused the offers of reconciliation which I made to her. She did not, it is true, hide herself away like any of those of whom I have spoken before, but nevertheless she did not evince the slightest symptom of regret for her previous conduct. At last, after a considerable interval, she intimated to me that her final resolve was not to forgive me any more if I intended in future to behave as I had done before, but that, on the other hand, she should be glad to see me again if I would thoroughly change my habits and treat her with the kindness which was her due. From this I became more convinced that she still entertained longings for me. Hence, with the hope of warning her a little more, I made no expressions of any intention to make a change in my habits, and I tried to find out which of us had the most patience. While matters were in this state, she, to my great surprise, suddenly died, perhaps broken-hearted. I must now frankly confess that she certainly was a woman in whom a man might place his confidence. Often, too, I had talked with her on music and on poetry, as well as on the more important business of life and I found her to be by no means wanting in intellect and capability. She had two the clever hands of Tatita Hime and Tanabata. When I recall these pleasant memories, my heart still clings to her endearingly. Clever in weaving, she may have been like Tanabata, but that is but a small matter, interposed Tono Chiochio. We should have preferred to have seen your lovers enduring as Tanabata's, Nothing is so beautiful as the brilliant dyes spread over the face of nature, yet the red tints of autumn are often not dyed to a colour so deep as we desire, because of the early drying of the dew. So we say, such is the uncertain fate of this world. And so saying, he made a sign to Sama no Kami to go on with his story. End of chapter 2, part 1